And you're on. Thank you. I'd like to call the meeting to order. We'll start with a roll call of school committee members. Jennifer. Here. Cassie. Here. Heather. Here. Mike. Here. Bill. Here. Nick. Here. And myself, Jane, I'm here. Thank you. Um, any members of the public who wish to attend the meeting may join the meeting through the links that may be found on the website. They're under school committee notices and agendas for upcoming meetings and tonight's school committee meeting is the date. Per Governor Baker's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access this school committee meeting. Members of the public can access the meeting via Montague Community Television broadcast. The extension of the emergency open meeting law provisions were signed into law as Chapter 20, Section 20 of the Acts of 2021. The school committee reserves the right to implement additional remote participation procedures and will notify the public of these procedures as soon as possible. And we'd like to welcome all our visitors this evening. We are live streaming and broadcasting on MCTV tonight. A recording of the meeting will be available on MCTV and also on our Gil Montague Regional School District website. We would like to welcome our Zoom audience. If you are in the Zoom audience, unless you are joining the meeting, would you please remember to keep your camera and your microphone off? Thank you so much. This will be the opportunity for public participation, which is policy BEDH. It has been reinstated to be held remotely, but we have not received any requests for public participation this evening. So welcome everyone, and we'll move right into important events. Brian, please. So um, in addition to what is on the school committee agenda, there have been several events that have been added in. I put them in the um, superintendent school committee summary report. Mm -hmm. First, the pandemic response advisory committee meets tomorrow at 4 p.m. Thursday, November 11th, as a reminder, is no school for the celebration of Veterans Day. Um, Sunday, November 14th, the high school and middle school band and choral ensembles will hold a concert at 1 p.m. at Pescomit Park, Pescom, Pescomskit Park in downtown Turners Falls. Friends of Sheffield Elementary um, meet on Wednesday, November 17th at 4 p.m. The Special Education Parents Advisory Council will meet virtually on Wednesday, November 17th at 6.30 p.m. And this will be a Parents' Rights in Special Education workshop. I did want to add that the Turner's Falls High School, Great Falls Middle School play, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe will be held um, at the Turner's Falls High School Auditorium Thursday, November 18th, Friday, November 19th, will both be at 6.30 and Saturday, the 20th, uh, the performance will be at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10 for adults and $8 for students. Uh, part of the new information that we received, and thank you to Melissa Bednarski and the district nurses, as well as our um, school physician, Dean Singer, who have arranged for two additional uh, COVID vaccine clinics. One will be held on November 18th at Gill Elementary School. Um, and this is for the entire community, but the Pfizer vaccine will be available for anyone um, ages five and over and other options for vaccines will be available. Um, Dean Singer, our, our district physician will also be holding a COVID vaccine clinic on Friday, November 19th at Hillcrest Elementary School uh, from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. On Saturday, November 20th, Friends of Hillcrest is sponsoring a fall festival at Hillcrest from 3 to 6 p.m. A reminder that Wednesday, November 24th is an early release day. And Thursday and Friday, November 25th and 26th, there's no school to, for the observance of the Thanksgiving holiday. And then at the end of the month, on mo uh, Monday, November 29th, from 1.30 to 5.30 p.m., that the Pfizer COVID vaccine clinic will be held at Sheffield Elementary School. And again, those are available to um, 
children ages five and up as well as members of the community and may include uh, boosters if people need them. Thank you. I believe we have a student report this evening. Is uh, Sina joining us for that? She's replaced Heather. <laughs> hi, Sina. Um, hi, my computer decided to die right before this, so I had to switch with my mom. But um, I don't have a ton to report on this week compared to, especially last week, right after um, Booster Week, because there was a bunch of stuff happening. But um, this week on the student council meeting, they critiqued a survey that is going to be given to students. So we gave feedback for that. And they also talked about fundraisers and a clothing drive that will happen after Thanksgiving. And we were also discussing the um, fall conference, which was apparently postponed and we're not completely sure on the date yet. But that's about all I have for now. Thank you very much, Sina. Bill, do you have a question or a comment for Sina? You're mute. Mm -hmm. There, I just want to know how you and your students, as often as you can tell us, how things are going as you re-entered school this year, uh, in person, um, that sort of thing. And I hope um, it's good, but it doesn't have to be. Well, I think it's definitely a lot, a lot better with everyone in school, everyone in person. Um, we also have masks on, so it's definitely safe, and we do have some social distancing policies still in place, but it's a lot better to be all together, I think, and it's a lot easier for students to focus and really understand things that are happening in the classroom. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sina. Thank yeah. you, Sina. Yeah. Okay, Brian, your report, please. Sure. So as, as part of my report, I, I have a couple of student recognitions and I'll, I'll um, if it's OK at this particular point so that um, I can let Kylie and Paige go. I'm going to I'd like to do them now rather than at the first agenda item, if that's OK. I think that's great. I was going to ask okay. if you'd like because I saw we had some special guests. So as the first student recognition, I, I wanted to acknowledge the Turner's Falls High School girls volleyball team who um, I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the game at Holbrook High School last uh, last Friday, where they beat a much higher seeded team, uh, three to nothing, uh, really dominated the game, carried themselves with a great deal of class and dignity in the victory. And you'll see in my report, I said, we wish them the best of luck as they take on Westport High School tonight, where they had to travel to Westport, Massachusetts, which is also a higher seed. I just received a text a few moments ago indicating that they won that match three to one. And congratulations to the girls volleyball team who is on to the quarterfinals of the state tournament. And um, we're very excited, very proud of them. Uh, they're a remarkable team. They care deeply about one another. It was an absolute pleasure to watch them compete last week. And uh, we'll wait to see who they draw. I think it's between Blackstone, Millville and um, Mount Greylock High School. They'll get the winner of those two in their next match. Uh, no time or date for that. Um, the next person I would like to introduce and uh, is this year's Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic Excellence. I'm proud to announce that this year's recipient of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic Excellence is Turner's Falls High School senior Paige Shulda. Paige, can you wave so they know who you are? <laughs> Paige is currently the second ranked student in the class of 2022 with an incredible grade point average on a scale of four of 4.35. She has consistently challenged herself by completing the most rigorous academic courses and has earned membership in the National Honor Society. As if maintaining such a course schedule is not enough, Paige also has a job outside of school and has made exceptional contributions to the school community. Her peers have recognized her leadership and selected her as captain of the varsity field hockey team, as well as vice president of student council. Paige has been a member of student council since ninth grade and also has also been ex selected as an advisory student leader and an MIAA student ambassador this year and has served on the athletic leadership council. And Paige is also a member of the state champion softball team. In addition to her leadership contributions, Paige has also made a commitment of service to our community. She served on the principal search committee over the summer and both in both ninth and 10th grade volunteered to gut pumpkins for the students at Sheffield Elementary School. 
Page also assisted those in need throughout the pandemic, assisting with a food drive, putting together and unloading community meals, and helped to make food baskets for families in our community. Paige Schulte is not simply an outstanding student, but a leader whose example to others leaves an exceptional legacy of leadership, kindness, and caring for others. And these qualities of character will serve her well as Paige's first choice of colleges is to join the University of Massachusetts nursing program. Congratulations and thank you for all you've done for our school community, Paige Schulte. Congratulations. Would you like to say anything? Uh, I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Paige. Like I said, you know, you might not have to say anything, but I trusted you if they put you on the spot that you'd be able to carry. It <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations to you and your family, and there'll be a little bit more information coming forward. Okay. Thank you. The second student I would like to recognize, and there are three students in this, but one of the students happens to be on that volleyball team. So I will be introducing them at a later date so that they and their family are able to attend. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce the first of two members of the class of 2022 to be awarded the National School Development Council Award for Academic Growth and Student Leadership in Learning, Senior Kylie Palmquist. Kylie, do you want to wave so they know who you are? <laughs> Kylie is an outstanding student who's achieved a, a, grade point, a 4.3 grade point average on a scale of four and has also been selected as a member of National Honor Society. She's been elected to serve as the school's Project 351 ambassador, class historian, and class secretary, and currently serves as the secretary for student council. In addition to Kylie's leadership contributions and academic achievements, she is committed to provide exceptional service to many youth in our community. Through her work as a, a junior camp counselor and bus monitor at Camp Kiwani, and as a daycare assistant teacher at, at the Jaduk Center for the Performing Arts, Kylie has had an incredibly positive impact on shaping young children in our community. However, Kylie's commitment to help others have not just been through local jobs. She has volunteered to do choreography for the high school's Matilda musical and for the combat scenes in the current production of Nar Narnia. Car Kylie has also volunteered to serve and support many youth productions at Jaduk, but was also a member of the Skeleton, Skeleton Crew Theater and is a praise team singer at her local church. Hillcrest Elementary students also benefit directly from Kylie's skill in working with children as she serves as an elementary school in intern at Hillcrest. One Hillcrest teacher who works with Kylie praised, oh, she's awesome. Many people think she's a staff member and I often have to remind them that no, she's just 17 years old. Um, hopefully we will one day be fortunate enough for Kylie Palmquist to be a member of our faculty as she plans to attend Westfield State University and major in elementary education and minor in theater arts. Congratulations to Kylie and thank you for all your service to the children of our community. Congratulations. Congratulations, Kylie. Would you like to say anything? Um, I just like to say thank you. It's a great honor and um, I love hearing what um, the elementary education teacher said about me. That's so sweet. And I love all of them. So it's just, it's really nice to hear that they have that same compassion for me. So thank you. And they get very excited in the afternoon when you show up over at the school. So <laughs> yes, I very get very excited to see them as well. I know. I had a chance to see you there today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you both very much. And um, <clears throat> I will be back in touch with both of you very soon. <clears throat> there are um, three more. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I did also want to announce we're proud to share that um, Lincoln Coleman, Jackson Cogswell, and Lake and Chessie have been selected to serve as Great Falls Middle School representatives to Project 351 for this year. Uh, and for Jennifer and uh, Jane, who had attended the conference, that's actually the organization that provided the students on the panel that we met with. Um, so they're connected with that group and I'm excited to see um, what they as representatives get out of the conference and what they bring back for service to our community. So congratulations to those students. In terms of COVID numbers, um, many of you may know that you know, the numbers have declined fairly precipitously in our area. Um, 
even in Greenfield, um, where they have a percent positivity of just 0.65 and they're down to 14 cases in the last 14 days, the town of Montague is down to seven cases in the last 14 days. So certainly things are headed in the right direction and we keep our fingers crossed that they will continue to. Of the towns in our area, Orange continues to struggle with the highest case count of 30 um, of those towns that we watch uh, and with a very, really high percent positivity of 4.06. But other towns are doing well and trending in the right direction. Uh, at the state level, the numbers uh, of cases still continue to decline, as does the percent positivity. The um, Board of Health is, is not providing specific information about the uh, number of individuals 12 and older who are fully vaccinated, but they are in the town of Montague. Um, and those numbers are 61% of Montague residents 12 and older are fully vaccinated. And as of November 8th, 69% have been administered at least one dose of a vaccine. The CDC still ranks uh, Franklin County as substantial risk of transmission as of Monday, November 8th. On Monday, November 1st, the select board voted 3-0 with an affirming recommendation of the Board of Health by two to one to rescind the mandate for wearing masks in town buildings and other indoor spaces that are open to the general public. Um, the select board now recommends that individuals who are not fully vaccinated wear masks when entering public indoor locations, including town buildings. We, of course, are still guided by the state um, and Department of Education's mask mandate at the schools. And so um, I did want to add as far as the, the Montague mask restrictions being lifted, they are not lifted at the Montague Public Libraries. Um, there is still a mask requirement in place for anyone who enters those buildings and maintenance of those orders will be managed going forward um, at the discretion of the library trustees and the library director. Ryan, could I just interject a question? Sure. Uh, because the play is at the high school. I know last time um, the play, it was required that everyone coming to see the play had to wear a mask. Yes. And I some of the community members were a little surprised. At this point, I know the school has the mandate to still wear masks, but what about an event like that? Yes, it's the same as it would be for athletic events. So it, the school, um, for any event that's held in on within the school building, that mandate applies. And so uh, the members of the audience will need to be masked. Thank you. I thought it would be helpful. Yeah, thank you for asking. If people knew ahead of time, thank you. Um, there are no new updates in food service, uh, and at this time, food service remains stable. Uh, they have increased the amount of meals that they're they're cooking. Um, however, we remain concerned about the potential impacts on menus, given the challenges of the supply chain, and we need people to be aware that, despite the fact that we'll make every effort to stick with the menus as they have been put out, um, there certainly is an increased possibility of uh, changes needing to be made to the menu at the last minute or with very little notice. I did want to um, take a moment to also acknowledge the hard work of Jimena Cabeza de Pereja, Stacy Langneck, Diane Ellis, and Jean Powers, and uh, trained youth student leaders who volunteered, organized, and conducted a highly successful English Learner Parent Advisory Council organizational event on October 27th at Sheffield Elementary School. This event was exceptionally well attended with every physically distant seat in the Sheffield cafeteria filled. Families were provided with Gil Montague book bags, water bottles, a wit and wisdom activity for home, as well as Bridges Math Games activity packet. We're also pleased that several parents at that meeting agreed to serve as standing members of the district's English Learner Parent Advisory Council. Thank you very much to all those who helped to make this evening a success. And thank you very much for all of those families who showed up um, and connected with each other during this event. And then as far as facilities updates, um, the district schools recently completed uh, water testing. All water tests have come back clear and no issues have been detected. The water results for individual schools can be found at the link at the bottom of the report. Um, and this report uh, will also be slightly edited now, adding in the volleyball information and um, 
will also be sent out to families as part of the superintendent's newsletter. So they'll also have access to that link. And that's it for my report for this evening. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or anything for Brian? Bill? Yeah, I'm unmuted. <clears throat> um, just on the food service business, I'm curious if there's any, I'll call it a baseline, but is there any menu that um, you can project is more stable than another one so that you could at least provide a minimum expectation of, of what could be available on any given day, or is that impacted by the, yeah, I know everybody's having issues with delivery, but is there anything like that that you're approaching? I think the, the most um, at-risk items are those that are the most perishable because we can't necessarily store them for long periods of time, but for for dry items or canned items and other things like that, that last for long periods of time, that we're reasonably well stocked, that we've received orders. And so while those things might be stable, you know, a, a, an example of something that I get concerned about is if we're not able to get a produce order in, then um, the high school, middle school students might not have the salad option for a day or two. Uh, and that has been a very popular item. Um, where they used to have a salad bar, now they do box salads as an option um, so that it's still there. Uh, but overall, everything is kind of touch and go. It's just the, the most perishable items are the ones that we're most at risk for because we ordered them on pretty short notice. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I can't hear you now, Jane, but I'm assuming you called on me, so I'm gonna go. Um, I was wondering about food service too, whether there's any, uh, well, uh, it seems, I, I'm wondering if, if uh, one of the issues is parents wanna know what's for lunch so their kids, because if they get there and they're not gonna eat it, then that's a problem. So is there any sort of update uh, at place for parents to get a, an update at the last minute? <clears throat> Joanne, do you wanna, do, you can feel free to jump in here if I'm not getting this correct. I think that, um, if it's possible to potentially get something out, um, but there are times when a, a menu item might need to be changed that day. And so there, there won't be very much notice. Um, it's not always possible for, for the cafeteria staff to go through and make sure that they have everything the day before, because they often begin prepping for the meals on the morning of, so that it's not sitting out um, you know, with air contacting it and therefore, you know, making the texture less palatable. Joanne, is there anything that you want to add to that? I mean, it, I, I think we could certainly, if we knew something, if there was a menu item coming up for a week in advance or later in the week that we have run out of and haven't been able to restock, then it, it would be uh, reasonable for Justin or the cafeteria um, supervisor in that building to communicate with the principal who could then send something out to families to make them aware, but it really isn't useful unless we've got at least 24 hours time for the parents to make a decision about, you know, whether or not they're going to have, have to send something from home. Right. I think some of the schools are starting to, they're more able to stay with their, the menu than other schools. And so I did ask Justin today to work with those cafeterias that have been changing their menus more and get notification in advance so that way it can get put out there so you know we'll see what we can get i would think we should know a couple of days in advance if we can't feed them something but if food shows up the day before you know or it's ordered and it's due to come in that would be the last minute changes so so we are working on a process to get word out of changed menus. Uh, I was, maybe when we talk about websites again, there might be a way to stick something like that on a website, but that's for another time. We do have menus on the website, but of course those are not necessarily the menus being served at each of the schools. So it's those last minute changes that we need to get from the school you know, like contact all four schools, make sure the menus are the same and then make those changes if, 
you know, they're being made, but I, I just, it's, it's a difficult thing with each school having a, something different. So we're working on that process, but we, we could update those menus on the website. Thank you. Anyone else have Thanks, anything Mike. for Brian? Okay, just a note, I should have uh, mentioned this at the very beginning of our meeting. For people in the audience that were wondering why we didn't start on time as we try, um, we were having a few technical difficulties, but uh, once we straightened them out, we were able to start our meeting. So thank you for your patience. Okay, I think next on the agenda, business and operations report, Joanne. Okay, um, we recently received notification from MSBA that we again did not make the cut for the gill roof. So we have applied for that, I think five times now, mm -hmm. and they just keep moving the goalposts. So at this point, they're saying it's a 29 year old roof that needs to be, you know, the roof needs to be 29 years old. And I believe ours is 25 years old. So we will try again next year. And hopefully by the time we try again, we've had the building condition assessment of the Gill Elementary School done. So we'll be able to include that in our packet. And I think that'll make a difference for them if they see you know, what else needs to be addressed in the school. And they see that we have done a whole building assessment. Well, and thank you. I just need to say on our behalf, thank you for your futile efforts in filling out the forms every year. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it. Eventually they'll say yes. So, but you know, I have to say that every time they say no, I'm relieved that we don't have to go through that process, right? It's a huge, huge process to go through after they approve us. You know, that's just a lot of work. So, well, it'd be good to get a roof. You know, I'm also somewhat relieved that I don't have to deal with that at this point. Um, the next thing I have is the Irving tuition. So each year we need to calculate the Irving tuition based on the prior year expenses. So once we finish the end of year report, I'm able to pull all those numbers, do the calculation using the current year enrollments. So as you can see from the chart, our enrollment is down significantly in fiscal 22 for Irving and also for the rest of the district. So when we do this calculation, our tuition rate for regular ed this year, especially, is much higher than it's been in the past because we're we have our cost to educate. And there's a lot of costs this past year that went into operations, you know, our facilities. And so all of those costs lead to, you know, divided by less students adds up to a higher per student tuition rate. Our special ed cost actually went down this year. I'm not exactly sure why that went down, but it could be that I think our, our enrollment in special ed is not shrinking like our enrollment in regular ed is. So the numbers of students that we have in special ed has stayed pretty flat, but the numbers of students we have in regular ed has shrunk. So the regular ed tuition has gone up from 11,948 to 15,413. And the special ed tuition has gone down from 40,594 to 37,859. So you can see that the seventh grade is much smaller in fiscal 22. And then the 12th grade is also smaller. So we had a larger senior class last year graduate and a very small seventh grade class come in. And then as typically we lose students leaving eighth grade going into ninth grade, primarily to the tech school. So about half of the Irving students typically go to tech. So I don't know if you wanted to vote this because I don't think we had it specifically on the agenda. I think or... this is a good time to do that. If, if okay. You. Um... Okay. So the regular education tuition rate of $15,413 and the special ed tuition rate of $37,859. Yes. I will entertain a motion to vote to approve those tuitions for Irving. So moved. Mm -hmm. Heather? Thank you. Second. Second. Mike? 
Thank you. Any questions, comments before we vote? Bill? Just on the total number for Irving is even though the cost of the student per student has increased their total budget to Gil Montague has decreased by a hundred grand. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And we were looking at that earlier in the year when I looked at the operating statement. And I think that we have an excess of revenue in a different line that's going to make up for that. I think it's charter reimbursement. It's going sure. to make up for that loss. So actually it's probably a good thing if this number is down because it could have bumped us up too high in revenue. I'm just looking at the, at the total number that Irving has to deal with. And even though the cost per, per pupil has increased, their actual obligation to us will be less, which That's is right. a positive when you go to town meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? We have a motion and a second. Uh, we will have a roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Cassie? Yes. Heather? Yes. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nick? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is a budget transfer, and this is to move $1,000 from tech ed supplies to theater art supplies. And theater is in a student activity line. Um, so it's a different category of the budget. It's not an instructional line. It's something that happens after school. And so it's a 35-20 line. And so we need your approval to move this. Um, the tech ed program works together to support the theater program. And so they wanted to move some funds into that line to help with props and the items that they're making for the program. Okay, okay. vote this now. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve that fund transfer. I move it. Bill, thank you. Second. And Mike seconded. Any discussion of that? All right, again, we'll hold the roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Cassie? Yes. Yeah. Heather? Yes. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yep. Yeah. Nick? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And the last item is just the warrant, but I know that's later on the agenda. Yes, we have that in our section. Okay. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Joanne on her report or anything else to do with her department? I guess we're good. Thank you very much, Joanne. You're welcome. Um, Director of Technology report. Hi. Hi, Tina. Good evening. I will actually share my screen, but if you don't mind um, the fact that I also have to manipulate a few things <laughs> as I do so. Thank you. If it weren't for your manipulation, these meetings would not be going on. So yeah. thank you very much. I just need to move a few things around in order to make it come out correctly on the recording. Here we go. Ah. Right. So good evening. So um, again, I'm Tina Mahaney, Technology Director for Gil Montague Regional School District, and um, here to um, do a quick technology at GMRSD um, report. Uh, this evening's report would actually be covering three things, your infra our infrastructure, our support and training, and our instructional technology. Um, I can't as you're very well aware of the fact that um, there are certain things that I may not be able to um, report in an open meeting, but then um, I think this in itself would actually give us a really good idea of how we are educationally um, in, uh, with regards to our technology. So to begin with, um, we have our in infrastructure and I hope you don't mind me explaining or giving a little overview of um, the infrastructure before I continue with the report, because um, in that way, 
um, I think it would actually really help to really get a good picture of where we are as we build from an infrastructure to support and training and um, into instructional technology. So our infrastructure is our Windows network. It's our, um, it consists of our servers, our virtual servers, our DNS, our file servers. Um, and some of them are also our end user devices, which we're in our admin, our staff, our teachers use mobile devices and desktops. And we, meanwhile, our students are on Chromebooks. Um, as a report, the network has two um, components that are kind of like wearing out is how we kind of call it in the less technical way. Um, first, we have a lot of UPS units. These are power units that are um, dead and have to be changed. And it causes the power outages to um, become a problem for us. But um, we're actually just like really looking at being able to replace that um, in within this fiscal year um, using our E-rate funding. And second is that we have um, also aging servers that are considerable risk to our network um, in two parts. One is software and one is in working or the replacing of the hardware parts. But this again is something that um, we are working on with uh, a budget and um, at least be able to still stay and but we're still capable of saying that we're quite in a stable and very secure network. Um, the following piece of that infrastructure is also our um, our local area networks and our wide area networks. So local area networks are the networks that connect all our computers within a building. And the wide area network is the one that connects all our school buildings together. Um, in doing so, we actually do so with um, either an ethernet connection or like hardwired connection, but mostly through Wi-Fi access, right? So Wi-Fi is all our mobile devices that are able to actually connect to then the internet. And presently our internet is on a one gigabyte MBI fiber connection between schools and um, a two gigabyte uh, connection to the internet, straight to the internet, wherein we also are taking advantage of the offering of Crocker that has a direct link to Google because in Springfield and Boston, which because Google is the um, system that we use the most. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. So um, we ran a, we did run, run a small feasibility study last year with regards to the wiring and the, um, uh, Wi-Fi access last year's and our switches. And we found out that based on this feasibility study that there's really, despite the fact that we already are in a five year run since if you remember since that um, uh, uh, connectivity funding that we got from DESI that allowed us to do this huge infrastructure change, um, our switches and our um, wirings and our wipe access points are actually really still very good, right? So that my concern right now is that um, is to actually wait till the new, there's a new technology that's up for a Wi-Fi 6E that is not yet really tested, as tested as, and or at least, you know, it doesn't make me feel secure enough to actually move to so that I think we can actually hold off on any kind of like, um, replacement or, be, or build up of that particular Wi-Fi network, since it's still really meeting all our needs. So that's with regards to our infrastructure. Um, next part of the report is with regards to our support and training. Um, just to really let you know that for technical support within our schools, our teachers and our staff actually email support at gmrst.org, which then goes directly to our ticketing software. Um, and the support is provided by this new incredible technology team that I'm so proud of. Um, our network support it, with Artemis Murray, our technology support, David Brown, our instructional support with Ms. Katie Hopp, and our data support with Rachel Vakul, who's actually through our pupil services and the kindness of um, Diane Ellis in letting us um, once in a while borrow her. Um, so from the start of the fiscal year, our support tickets had gone up to like 1,800 emails. 
But last month, it has finally gone down to 184. So that's a huge difference that we, um, we were so glad had actually started happening um, in this last month. As most of the starting support emails were mostly about um, you know, logins and access to hardware, internet issues. Now that we've already gone down to this, to um, you know, a more, you know, more doable kind of, uh, load, they actually are. If you looked at those those questions and those those support tickets, are more of um, substantial and more qualitative kind of like support needs. So as much as you know, um, we try very hard to maintain and as you can see in the last um, you know two months we had a 93.4 percent resolution rate as much as we try to it's like sometimes we really do take time to go through the support tickets because really the, our, our um, teachers have been asking quite you know the the, the shall we say the real instructional um, questions that really require a lot of our time um, and just a quick one about the SIMS October report that's been submitted. Um, and now EPIMS and, and SES, which then covers our employees and our course schedules are doing the mem uh, due in November. Meanwhile, access to our databases like our SIS, our Outlook, our Active Directory, Google, um, all this SNAP, Infinite Visions, they're all managed with the help of our tech team and the student services and the business office. So um, it's really been, you know, uh, quite the beginning of the school year, but, uh, but then really all my gratitude for the help coming from the tech team itself, but also coming from student services and, business, and the business office, working as within the central office. So um, with regards to our technical training, um, just a quick shift on that one. Our technical training kind of covers everything that's very much on the instructional side. Um, one of the most important ones are the Google workshops. One of the things that we really decided and um, realized was very important was that instead of pounding our, um, our teachers with so many different kinds of, of links and um, educational places. What we pretty much did was that we really concentrated on two very strong Google workshop places um, and training. One is the Teacher Center for Google itself for education. And the other one is actually a um, working, so it's Google for education wherein you really do cover a lot of the different products that Google has, which is quite considerable. And then, um, also, following that, we also um, sponsored this EdTech teacher workshop that was like put together by EdTech, Google, and DESI itself. So um, this is a very strong workshops that then focuses on really what and how you can use Google in your classroom for teaching. So um, those are a few, those are just the two things that we actually um, did recommend for our teachers to go through, but in itself are very strong um, training uh, sites. Um, we also gave them trainings on TouchView and TouchView is the um, panel that um, now replaced our projectors in the classroom. Again, um, due to COVID, we had actually increased the, and was able to complete um, the, uh, installation of all the touch views in all the classrooms of um, all our for the whole district so that um, our touch views actually are interactive display panels so that they're also touch sensitive so they're able to and um, can connect directly to the internet so there's a lot of different features to it that we're trying to keep on passing to our teachers and um, we also created like um, a website that has that contains most of our workshops, um, like the GMRSD technology workshops um, that was started um, the several uh, two years ago with regards to um, you know different kinds of ways to actually use the new technology. And what we did was we um, recorded this one because these are workshops that were. Um, uh, 
taught by our teachers or our own teachers and so that we recorded most of their of their um, different kinds of workshops and made it available still available to our teachers so um, following that we're looking at really you know doing workshops with regards to what does it mean to be a one-to-one -one school um, basically a one-to-one -one district or an enhancing curriculum and technology digital literacy and digital citizenship and, and safety. So that's for, the, for um, support and training. And moving on to instructional technology, which is really the more, you know, the meekiest part of, of the report. In instructional technology, it's like really, you know, I'm so excited about it because it's, you know, we're going through leaps and bounds of it. It's like, um, you know, starting with a one-to-one -one program where in every student right now from kindergarten to 12th grade have been assigned a Chromebook. We also have two full parts of Lenovo's um, Chromebooks at Hillcrest for the pre-case use and new devices were given to the 10th graders at the beginning of the school year while new devices own, are now ready to be distributed to our 11th graders, replacing the, um, the old 3180s um, that in the beginning of the school year. Um, we applied and received an emergency connected connectivity fund grant to cover the purchase of this replacement um, devices. And, um, and just to report, there have been at least 43 repair re requests from the beginning of the school year. Um, another part, another breakthrough in instructional technology is the use of our Google domain. Um, be, and basically at gmrc.us provides us with a myriad of educational uses from a learning management software in Google Classroom to a collaborative work, work, workspace in Google Workspace for Education. It's a strong communication tool that brings out teaching and learning into a different level of a non-linear exchange, which makes it really exciting. Let's well, so that we really want to welcome this online workspace as a tool of inclusion and equity that makes educational opportunities more accessible to, our, to all our students. Other things we also have are online resources that we have, that we have subscriptions for different kinds of software. So most of them are like Seesaw and Nearpod, which are interactive learning platforms learning platforms and expand we also expanded the application of iReady to allow us to assess and better understand our students and our elementary students have access to stem scopes a science learning curriculum and ras kids for interactive leveled ebooks to name a few more to provide that scaffolding we um we wanted to uh, to ensure that we can ensure the access to learning um, educational data, as for educational data, as it, as it was reported last year, last meeting rather, by our teaching and learning director, I, um, Jean Powers, iReady is now being implemented in the middle school and high school through its diagnostic tests and instructional programs. Now, um, just a quick note about this, right, how this Digital application of iReady, of assessments and instructional programs, not only provides us data to the teacher's classroom, right? To guide the teacher in her classroom, but it also provides our students an understanding of their own growth and achievement, right? And, it, and this is in line with our district goal of engaging our students as active partners in their learning. And lastly, with regards to communication, in, our line, in line with our goals of family and student engagement, engagement, we've added a new Facebook and Instagram account, thanks to Rachel Vakula and Student Services, as well as continue, continue to develop our website in tune with all our social media applications. So all together, we also continue to use our student and parent portals, as well as integrate our teacher plus portals with Google Classroom. It's this type of interoperability that helps us streamline our work on better communication with our students, family, and community. And the last thing that I really did want to mention is like, is for this particular report is how grateful I am to actually have this strong team that we have right now, who actually covers our network, our technology, our instruction, and our data and communication. Um, these are the pieces that, you know, it's like, I've worked hard to build through all these years because 
essentially out of my experience in instructional technology, this is what I've found has been like the, the meat of everything that we do is really that um, the, the vital foundation of everything that we do is actually having a good team that collaborates to work together to support our teachers. So that is basically um, the, this website that I've created is actually something that I can email to everybody so that if you're interested in like um, looking at it further um, with regards to, to, again, infrastructure, support and training and instructional technology. And that's pretty much what I have for a technology report. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Tina. Wow. <laughs> thank you very much. That's all I always get a wall. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It really, wow. I, I easily like throw everybody off. <laughs> no, well, you certainly didn't miss anything. <laughs> but that's all good. And, and please express to your team, you know, how much we appreciate all of their hard work as well. Most definitely. Thank Anyone you. Anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, Bill? Yeah, am I am I on? I'm on. Yes, you um, are. My question is really about the touch view. Is is that a, a teacher's instrument similar to? I mean, in in my life, it's an overhead projector with an erasable crayon, <laughs> and so the teachers are doing the touch screen, and the students are able to pick it up on their Chromebooks. Or is it just a display in the front of the room or both? Right, so it's just a display in front of the room, but then if it all depends on how we're actually using it. Like for example, one of the things that we're trying to do is that that display actually connects itself independently to the, to, to the internet. So on the internet then, that means that cloud service can actually um, access your Google Docs, right? And if your yeah. Google documents are up there, the students can also have them on screen, but um, you know they can be independent of the of the computers. They can be. We also have a software that's called Go Guardian, which allows the teachers to manage the screens of their students. So, which then brings us to that really, uh, which brings us to a very interesting question, Bill. Right? Is that when do we, how do we start thinking now about the fact that here we have, we have our projection, our projections on a, a large screen projection, and then you have your small screens, right? On your screen. How do you start, how does that start to change the classroom dynamics? How do you start to change your classroom instruction, given that you have all those kinds of screens in front of you, right? So yeah, yeah. great question. Which leads to another question. <laughs> Not from here. World of technology. <laughs> it's really exciting. It's like, um, you know, to be very honest, I'm, I'm very excited about everything that we've been able to do in the classroom with our students, with our teachers. Thank you. Anyone else have anything for Tina? Thank you very much, Tina. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We appreciate it. Um, the next item on our agenda, school committee report. $5.20. I will entertain a motion. Okay. I guess I won't. You're back. Perhaps yep. I should start that Don't over. Move. Don't move. Did any, <laughs> it, did any of it come out? No. At the, the very end, yeah. the $5 and something cents, but we were all laughing oh, and couldn't hear that. Really either. Cost, but, uh, that sounds okay. super cheap. <laughs> yes. The accounts payable warrant for this meeting. It's for fiscal year 22 is number 3211. The date is 11-10-2021. The amount is $110,465.20. I'll entertain a motion. A little different than the first amount, but so moved. <laughs> All right, you gotta pay what you gotta pay. Second. And Cassie moved and Mike seconded. Any discussion of that? 
Bill. It was a rough 34 pages to look through to add up to only 114,000. Uh, well, yeah, and we have had longer ones. I will, I will vouch for that. <laughs> Maybe there were more small purchases. Only kidding. I know, I know. It's. I always enjoy reading the details. Um, I will, uh, since we have no discussion, we will take a roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Cassie? Yes. Heather? Yes. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nick? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the business portion this evening, um, recognition of senior awards recipients. I think we have covered that thoroughly, correct, Brian? Yes. Yes, we moved that up because we had uh, the students in the family. <laughs> oh, you froze again. She'll come back. Things pretty much stand where they are. There still is a mask mandate in Massachusetts schools. So when Jane, we, we we lost you for a bit, just to give oh, you a heads up. Okay. Um, so maybe start with the agenda item again. We okay. Want to pass the uh, student um, recipient. Second, thank you. The second item is discussion of remote in-person school committee meetings, and we have not had any more recent developments. Um, the mask mandate still applies to schools in Massachusetts for the time being, I believe. I can't remember who, when the governor has made that, um, but it will be later this year that there will be the option of perhaps not needing to have masks when we meet in school. So any questions or comments about that? Um, sorry, I can't turn on my video. I just want to say, given that you know, it was just approved that five through 11 can have the vaccine. I think it's something that we should keep talking about Absolutely. because as more, you know, full families get vaccinated, it, it is going to change the numbers. And, right, right. That could yeah. change the landscape greatly. That would be extremely helpful. So we are getting closer. Thank you. Um, the next item, this is the third reading of policy ACAB, and we will need to vote to approve it. It is a, the policy is anti-discrimination, anti-harassment policy and grievance procedure. We have updated it um, in a very minor way, just adding a few items. Brian, do you want to refresh people's memory about that? Yeah, and so the, we've been, we've had the procedure added um, based on legal recommendation from last summer. <clears throat> um, to our staff handbook. However, <clears throat> um, later this week, I have a consult with um, our attorney to discuss there is one individual still missing, um, which is a male member uh, of the investigatory team. Um, and because we only have two males on the administrative team as of now, myself and Christopher Barnes, uh, the rest of the admin team is female. Um, I wanted to consult with the attorney to see whether or not they needed to be administrators, whether or not we should combine resources with another school district, which is also a fairly common practice with these changes, um, or whether or not I can look within the bargaining units for a male uh, to serve in that capacity. Um, and um, I anticipate having that done and updated by Friday uh, once the policy itself is approved, that's just a matter of adding the directory information and making sure it's out there for staff to access. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments on that? That represents equal representation of the sexes, is that it? Yeah, there needs to be gender rep. It's one of the changes to um, the federal portions of the law is that it, it, there needs to be, there are particular tiers of representation and a male superintendent, or for that matter, a female superintendent should not insert themselves as the representative of uh, one gender or another 
because we have to be the point of appeal um, for an investigation or for the process. So um, I'm not able to serve in that capacity as one of those, as the male representative. And so with that one other person, I just wanted to check with council to see whether or not we could simply insert there or whether or not, you know, we should look to do something different. Cool. Anyone else? So this evening, if we're voting, it would be to vote to approve the policy with the understanding that um, there would be another person inserted into that section where we need to add another name. Mm -hmm. And that will be provided to us at a future meeting, correct, Brian? Yeah, sir, I can even email it out to the committee as part of the updated, uh, email the committee the updated staff handbook once it's added at the end of the week. Okay. Any other thoughts on that, Mike? Well, I, I was going to move the uh, article to approve it, but also to suggest that I can't imagine we have to re-vote it every time we change a name on the, on the thing. So I'm not too worried about that part. Yeah. Thank you. So we have Mike moved the question. Okay. I'll second it. Bill, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, roll call vote. Jennifer? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Heather? Yes. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nick? Might have lost Nick. He's there. Nick can. Maybe he's become un has an unstable connection. I can, you can just like thumbs up if it's a yes. That's close. Thank you. That's good. And myself. Thank you. We have to adapt to whatever technology is doing for us at the moment. So we have that approved unanimously. Um. The next item under business is discussion about addressing issues of equity. Brian? So just a brief update uh, in this area tonight. Um, as I mentioned in the summary report, uh, again, thank you to Jimena, Stacy, Diane, Jean, and the student youth trained youth leader volunteers who had worked with us during the summer who helped pull off a very successful English Learner Parent Advisory Council um, and Family Night. Uh, on October 27th, it's one of our district goals. And um, Diane has been working very hard to try to get a, a standing committee. And I'm, I'm very proud that their approach got families to commit um, to have a standing English learner parent advisory council for the first time. And, um, you know, obviously that'll be a great resource for us in the district because we've already gotten feedback from families in, in efforts to try to solve problems. And they've been very helpful and we've managed to resolve some problems with their suggestions and recommendations. So we're looking forward to having those families as a working group. Um, and thankful, thank, thank you again to those people who pulled that off. Uh, I'm disappointed to report that Gil Montague was not among the limited number of districts uh, selected to participate in DESE's pilot program on educational equity. But as those programs arise again, we will continue to apply for those opportunities to participate. Um, they did select, um, it was somewhat arbitrary. Uh, they needed to get schools from various areas of the state. I think there were something along the lines of 89 districts that had applied for 24 spots. And so if another opportunity comes up in the, in the future, we'll put in for it. Um, at the elementary level, in terms of uh, training, uh, as Jean had mentioned in a previous school committee meeting, that um, the three-part professional development that's been put in place at the elementary level, brave elementary educators talk about race, the first part, session one, um, where staff took part in a virtual session with the providers from CES, uh, where they met in breakout rooms to reflect on their own personal strengths, vulnerabilities, and needs with regard to having discussions about race with students. They then received foundational language and skills to support those discussions on the October 20th offering. For session two, staff will continue to build their skills in leading discussions. The presenters will model the use of, of a children's book 
to address areas of race and equity, and that will take place on September 8th, on December 8th. Uh, in the meantime, the elementary principals have been also consulting with CES um, so that they have an idea in it well in advance of what uh, the capacity of their faculty should be from the first session and what they should prepare their faculties for for the second session. At the secondary level, the um, The group of teachers who have taken the lead in bringing the, the, move, the film, I Am Not a Racist, Am I, uh, to students at the high school, now has 16 staff members who have been trained to facilitate uh, discussion following the student screening of the film. And there are uh, nine students who have begun the training to also assist with the facilitation of the screening of the film. The students will finish their training and then those students will be uh, will take part in the planning with the staff to finalize the facilitation of the discussion. So we're excited to have some student leaders who are not only being trained to act as facilitators, but are also going to be given the leadership opportunity of um, sitting in with the faculty to have discussions about the structure, how it should be done, the concerns that they have, how to deal with those issues. And so uh, I'm very appreciative of the leadership of um, Cheryl Thompson and the role that she has played in reaching out to students and identifying kids who might be interested in participating as facilitators. Uh, I think it's an excellent opportunity to have students, you know, interact on a, um, on, a, on a personal and a professional level directly with our faculty and again, elevate their voice on a very important issue. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you're saying all of this, but I just want to say it myself, is I think it's a great opportunity to provide a different generational perspective to the same issue, and thereby it's a dual learning uh, participatory exercise where the adults have to also learn to understand um, the, the younger generation's uh, outlook. I hope that's true. Yeah, and I hope, you know, uh, I, um, I hope that part of what comes out of this is that faculty take the opportunity to ask students, you know, because we're not, we're not all out there on social media the way that children are, you know, it's, it's a different world. While some people are, um, they're certainly not in the world of kids. Um, and I think it would be helpful to, for the educators to be able to hear from, from kids what kinds of things are out there in, in their world that they might not even be aware of. Um, and I think that will be really helpful to have, you know, a group of young people sitting with a group of people who have all of that life experience and training and sharing those ideas back and forth, I think will help make it a, a better facilitation process when the film is shown and, and kids have to reflect on it. Her connection will come back. It looks like you might be back, Jane. I think I'm back. I'll try that one again, too. Fortunately, I don't mind repeating myself. <laughs> the next is update from Six Town Regional Planning Board and selection of dates for facilitator forums to be held about that research. So jo Joanne was going to. Joanne was gonna take this one to talk about some of the dates as she had a conversation with a member uh, of the Six Town Regional Planning Board just a short time before the school committee by phone to get some updated information. Okay, Joanne, thank you. So <clears throat> the Select Board Finance Committee spoke, I'm not sure if it's the Select Board or the Finance Committee from Montague. They spoke last night, they met. And they said the two dates that worked for them would be on Thursday, November 18th or Tuesday, December 7th. So it can be a different date than we have for our staff or for our community, but December 7th is a day of a school committee meeting. So I suggested to Lynn that she 
let them know that November 18th would work better so that it allows you all the opportunity to go to that same meeting. Um, so we need to also set something up for our staff and we would need to have a time for the general public to come to a meeting. So the high school auditorium is not available until the play is completed. And I believe that is next weekend. So we really couldn't schedule anything until at like Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving. So I don't think she has, let me see my calendar. Yeah, November 22nd would be available. So that would be a day that we could schedule something in the high school auditorium, or we could go to um, early December, the first, the third or the sixth, or, you know, we could also have something at the Sheffield auditorium that could be happen when the play is still happening <coughs> right on the same date as that. But we don't want to eliminate the people that would be in the play or going to the play or participating in that from coming to the meeting. So I would suggest the November 22nd date if we need to use the high school auditorium. Um, or we could do something earlier on the 18th of November prior to, you know, I think the, the thought is the facilitator would come out and do multiple meetings in one day in a town, okay, right? So that's no, what I was going to ask, yes. Right, so if November 18th is one of the days that she's going to do that, then we could have something in the Sheffield Auditorium. We might be able to have something smaller in a conference room. How about the, high the cafeteria? School. The cafeteria, right? We could do something in there. I don't think that the play would be using that. I the think the, the I think that the the production actually does have some setup in the cafeteria, although it wouldn't take up the entire room. But there are other alternatives. The library is a space that we could use that's pretty good sized. Okay, and I know that what's happening at the town hall, they could do a virtual and in person meeting. So that would be something that people could participate in remotely as well. So if it's looking like the 18th would be a good day, we could set up something in the library for the high school staff right after two right around 2.30, as long as that is not their meeting day, their staff meeting day. And then we could have a general public session maybe at four o'clock in that same space at the high school. And then they would move on to the early evening, 6.30 time at the town hall. Um, I do see that there is a small group that has a meeting scheduled on the afternoon of the 18th from four to six. Oh, a small group of staff members and school committee members. Okay. From four till six? Yes. Okay, so if we have the staff available, the staff meeting at 2.30. That would work. That would work. And then the general public meeting at four o'clock, as long as we have a space that's available. So we'll have to check. Yeah. That. Joanne, I don't know if the, Library would, I mean, we have no idea how many people are necessarily going to come out. The only concern that I have is the size and space in the library that if we had a fairly significant turnout <clears throat> that we should probably be using the auditorium for the general public one. Right, so then we, we could do that at Sheffield. Yeah. Right, so the general public could meet at Sheffield in the auditorium. And the long general that isn't used for the after school program. Right. Which would still be happening at that time. Right. What time were you saying for the general public meeting? Four o'clock. So, so it's 2.30, 4 o'clock, and wasn't there a 6.30? 6.30. For? The town hall. The town hall. Um, let 
I, so school committee would be part of the staff meeting. So it wouldn't be just or, staff, it would have to be all the staff would have to have opportunities. Right, I mean, the regionalization is really about merging the two secondary schools, not the elementary schools. Right, right, I, I do understand that. Yeah. So I mean, we pick another day. I mean, the thought was that Montague is much larger than all the communities. It's actually Montague's the same size as all the other communities put together. And right. so maybe there is, you know, more than one day could be devoted to Montague. And so we could have another, you know, a staff, a, a time that staff could come to Sheffield in the auditorium at maybe 3.30 one day. <coughs> so we, what did we say? November 18th, 2.30 high school, four o'clock Sheffield for public and then 6.30 at the town hall. Um, if we wanted to do something on December 7th before your school committee meeting, maybe school committee could meet remotely with the facilitator. Previous to the meeting. Right, prior to the meeting. Um, Berniston has selected November 7th, but I don't know what time. So I was looking at that. That could be a conflict. Yeah, that may be a conflict. I think they're probably anticipating several meetings, it looks like. Right. So that won't work. Uh, what so, about the let's see. Second, you had mentioned. Yep, the 22nd would be a Monday before Thanksgiving. So we could do 3.30 at Sheffield to allow the staff to come. And then we could do, I don't know what time school committee would want to meet. Is this all, all on the 22nd now? On the 22nd, right. We could do another general public session at five maybe to allow people who work till five to come. And then 6.30 for school committee. And by the 22nd, we could, we could use the auditorium at the high school again though? Yes. Right, so we could flip high school in Sheffield yeah. session. So November 18th could be 3.30 at Sheffield. And then maybe 4.30 at Sheffield for the general public. On the 22nd would be 2.30 at the high school. Well, uh, again, if we were thinking about doing high school and middle school staff at 2.30 when their day ends, we're going to get right. more, because it's voluntary, we'd get more people to come out at 2.30. Right. And we were thinking about having that in the library, right? At the okay, high well, if we do that on the 22nd, we could be in the auditorium. Okay. I'm wondering if the 22nd in general would be better if we could just have it in one location and um, have a series of meetings, perhaps. Of the different groups moving in and out. Yeah, I was just wondering, might make it simpler for organization to. Okay, so if we do the high school at 2.30, could do the elementary at 3.30, but they have to get from their schools over to the high school. Um, so 2.30 and then 3.30. I mean, we can even say 3.45. It gives them more time would, to get there. Be, yes, that would be better. Right. Because some of, you know, maybe some of the staff may be speaking as parents. So then 
5.15 could be the general public. And then 6.30 school committee. And would you want to do that remotely or would you want to go to the high school if she'll be at the high school? That certainly is possible because it, we wouldn't have the complication of having to broadcast and all the other things that. Right. Um, it would just be a, a meeting per se. Right. What do people think about the date, the time, Bill? I think all of it's great, but I want to tell you, first of all, it's nice to try to plan everything all at once and talk about all the staff doing it at one time. It probably isn't going to happen um, in, in real time. And secondly, this is not a do or die situation. This is only an initial focus group introduction to the whole concept. And there is opportunity from the facilitator for anyone to send her questions via email and she will try to get through them all. Uh, there's also opportunity if we get an additional grant come January 1st that we're gonna continue this process into next spring. So if somebody happens to miss the boat this time, they haven't missed the boat. They just didn't get on that passage. And uh, I think we should go from there. There's a lot of work to be done, mostly in the communication part as to the whole thought process behind this. And I think whatever you can arrange will uh, be beneficiary in that direction. Um, I expect to be attending a lot of these meetings as a representative of the study board. Um, so, you know, the from, from my perspective, I guess I should say the fewer meetings, the better, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm, I'm happy to do them all. Thanks, Bill. Anyone else have thoughts about? I think right now, Joanne, are we looking at basically on the 22nd of November, correct? Right. 22nd of November. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Cassie. No, I was just going to second what Bill say, said and, and just, you know, there's been so much work done behind the scenes and I'm really excited that there's this community engagement piece um, and that, you know, like Jen Audley's on the board now and I think that there's going to be really important conversations had. So that was just all I was going to say. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad that I know there was a, a lot of background work to be done and I'm sure um, people wouldn't realize how many meetings the group has had to have, but we appreciate the work. And I have had community members asking me about when there might be a forum where they could attend. And there will be information I would expect on the information for the meetings about uh, what Bill mentioned, that there is a survey that anyone may could fill out before the deadline is December 3rd. If someone wasn't able to make one of the meetings or just preferred to fill out the survey, that's an option. Okay. So this isn't necessarily something we have to take a school committee vote on, but if it sounds like a reasonable plan, maybe a thumbs up would be good. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to go through it again. I have November 22nd, which is a Monday, at the high school in the auditorium. It would be high school staff at 2.30, elementary staff at 3.45, general public at 5.15, and school committee at 6.30. Sounds good. And thank you, Joanne, for working on that with us. You're welcome. And Brian will also need a time for admin to meet with them, so we'll have to pick that time as well. Okay. So I will send that this out to Lynn Reynolds and um, Mary to get on the calendar for that date. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.
Okay, the next item on the agenda is discussion and potential vote on graduation caps and gowns policy. Brian. So um, back in October, I had asked the school committee to vote for unifying class color. Uh, subsequently went back to the senior class um, to explain to them what I had done and ask them to reflect on what they would like to do as a graduating class. Because, and I apologize for not having consulted with them uh, as an entire group. Um, they met shortly after that meeting and they did a secret ballot. The class advisors shared an email with me indicating that the class overwhelmingly voted to return to uh, what they had been used to from the two previous years uh, under the policy where students had the opportunity to choose uh, between blue and white caps and gowns and I am supportive of their desire to do so. And so I would like to make a recommendation to the committee that um, we support what the seniors would like to do as it has not caused issues with, uh, with gender and they, are, they would be appreciative of the opportunity certainly to have their voices heard. Thank you, Brian, for going back to meet with them as a group. Um, and if I understand it, um, what the students are requesting and choosing is that every graduating senior could choose whether they wanted a blue or a white gown and whether they wanted a blue or a white cap. Yep. Um, that would give them flexibility. And I just have to say personally, that makes sense. Yep, the in, um, they're not looking at it as an issue of gender identity. And, and I think the two previous graduating classes have proven that there have been there's been no application of pressure that we've been aware of. I did speak to them, the, the graduates or the senior, current seniors about that. Um, and they feel strongly that uh, their, their choices represent their individual freedom of expression within the context of what the school committee will provide for them. And um, I'm, as Mike had mentioned at that meeting, um, I'm supportive of what they would like to do because it, it meets the, the regulations um, by not specifically identifying students by their gender. Bill? Jane, are you, are you suggesting because you separated gown from caps that students could pick a, a blue gown and a white cap? Uh, I, are, are the yeah. students interested in doing that? I specifically yeah. mentioned that because we have had that on occasion in the last two years. Some yep. students have chosen that. So I wanted that out there for people to understand that was also part of the choice the way I understood it. So you did mean my interpretation was correct. They could, yes, I did. They I could did. mix. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Bill, in looking at the school committee vote from a couple of years ago last year, I had a request from a, a student who had graduated last year um, to um, do something different. The school committee policy didn't allow for that. However, what it did allow for um, was that the student was able to wear one, one color gown, one color hat, ga uh, cap, and that's what they chose to do um, because this, the, the vote, the language of the vote didn't preclude them from doing that. Bill? Can I make a motion to amend our previous vote on caps and gowns to initiate the previous uh, process, which was individual students could choose a white or blue gown and a white or blue cap? Okay, I was a little, my connection was a little unstable at the beginning. Is that a motion, Bill? It was. Thank you so much. We have a motion from Bill. Do we have a second? Second. I'll second Either. that. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll take a vote by roll call. Jennifer? Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. Cassie? Yes. Heather? Yeah. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yes. Nick? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. And thank, thank you. Thank the students for letting us know what they preferred. I will. That's and important. thank you. 
Um, and the last item of business is discussion about scheduling a school committee meeting, school committee meetings with students. School committee in the past has had in person meetings with students. I believe the general provision is about every couple of months. We were not able to do that um, during COVID. Um, so I think Mike had a great suggestion that now with virtual meetings, not only were we not able to during COVID, but even before that, it was very hard with student schedules and um, school committee member schedules to pick a time that worked for both. So now that we have the option of virtual meetings, um, that we might want to think about starting that virtually and seeing if that worked for people. Anyone have any during the school day, right? Um, whatever day seems workable. Did you have a thought, Mike? No, I, I was just thinking what you said that we could expand the field a little bit if, if Tuesday evenings are good for students. I have no idea, but uh, you know, uh, what we might just uh, ask them what's best for them. I, I think uh, their needs might be a little more picky than ours, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone with no kids in the house anymore, so I may be wrong about that. Well, especially once we hear about all the accomplishments of our athletes and the accomplishments of our students in the performances, and I'm sure there's many other clubs and activities and part-time work that students do as well as volunteering so you're right i think they probably have pretty complicated schedules so could we perhaps brian get um some suggestions whether you know however the high school would like to determine it if we want to start with high school and perhaps you know whether they want to talk to the student body whether they want to go through the student council and have them ask um the students, whatever works best for them, would be great. And then come back to us with some suggestions. Sure. Okay. Anyone have any thoughts, pro or con? Heather? Um, in the past, I've done this for a few years. I love it. And I can't wait to do it again. But um, in the past, I think we have brought it to them. It doesn't mean to say they would agree this year. It's a whole different group of kids. But I know that they do like the lunchtime. They don't like to take time out of classes. They don't like to do it after school. <laughs> seems to be, or seems to have been um, the past thing. So my guess is it's probably gonna be gap time or, or lunch time were the, were the favorite times. Mm -hmm. But of course, asking is the best option. Right. There, there may be some students, <clears throat> however, with, with remote that they could be home and potentially take half an hour to meet late afternoon, early evening, they might right. be more amenable to that than they were in the past where they had to drive up to the school or whatever. That's true, remote. Yeah. And that, that might provide us an opportunity also to get some time with some middle school students. Well, that's what I was thinking. We could also see about um, other ages um, that might want to participate. That'd be great. Because it is always, as Heather and Mike have said, it's always really, really great to meet with the students and get their perspective on, on things and let them ask us questions as well. And Cassie knows this as an educator and Jane, you were a long time teacher that you might just wanna come up and volunteer to work a lunch duty and, and do it that way. Cause there's nothing more fun than working a lunch duty at, at, at uh, high school and middle school. As it actually a, is kind of fun. As a former educator, I preferred playground duty personally, but that was just me. <laughs> I think so, that yeah. sounds fun though. It, it does sound fun, Cassie, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so yes, if, if it's acceptable with the members, uh, we would ask Brian to um, contact the high school and see what where we might start and then we can work from there. And hopefully by our next regular meeting, we would have some um, suggested times and dates. Anything else on that? Okay, the next item, we have some minutes to approve. The minutes are from October 26th. 
I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from that meeting. So moved. Okay, Second, Mike. Kathy. And Cassie seconded. Any discussion of the minutes? Okay, we will need a roll call vote again. Jennifer? Yes. Cassie? Yes. Heather? Yes. Mike? Yes. Bill? Yes. Jo uh, Nick? Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you. We have two more meetings scheduled for this month. We have a uh, next Tuesday is our meeting for um, continuing working on our school committee goals. And that will begin at six o'clock. And then the following Tuesday is our regular school committee meeting on the 23rd at 630 unless we have an executive session ahead of time. Um, they will both be virtual meetings, the special meeting to work on goals and the special meetings that we have are not broadcast on the television, but they will be posted meetings. That one will be any questions. Was I adjourn? Uh, was I unstable again? <laughs> I'm going to ask for Comcast to refund my money because you know this is not really working as well as they told me it would. <laughs> okay, well, I'll move to adjourn to get you out of uh, so prevent you freezing again. Oh, sounds good, Mike. I'll second that, and Cassie will second it. Any reasons you don't want to leave? I'm for one, I'm ready. All right, uh, we have to have a roll call for that too. Gosh, it's also official. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. Cassie. Yeah. Heather. Yes. Mike. Yes. Bill. Yes. Nick. Yes. And myself, yes. Thank you all very much. I'll talk to you in a minute, Brian. And Joanne, can I speak with you for a minute when we're done? Sure. Um, Mike is still with us, Mike Jackson.